All righty. So good evening, my dear friends. I am so glad to be here to share some more pictures and stories and really cool information from our uh, trip to South Africa. This is going to be focused tonight on the animals that we encountered in South Africa. So I am going to move to on my screen share um, and start my little slideshow. And here we are. Okay. So this is part two, and we will have a few more uh, parts of the um, of the of my slides. We will have some more of those. Um, there we go. So, uh, but again, we're going to focus on South Africa. So this is my little. It's called a rondeval. I believe that's what they're called. And most of the camps in the Kruger National Park have these little individual. Um, they're made cement, but they actually still do have a real thatched roof. And um, they're just charming. They have their own bathrooms. They have, like this one had three beds, three twin beds in it. <laughs> so you could fit quite a few people in it, but they're really sweet and very cozy and comfortable. And uh, so this was um, the, the first place in Kruger that we stayed. Um, and, but each, each place we stayed had these with the exception of the very last place. I just want to show you that. So these are two beautiful male impalas. Um, you can see that beautiful curve of their horns, the white tail, the gorgeous markings. Interestingly, these guys are darker than the impalas in Kenya. So, and this was in the late afternoon, early evening, but you can see they're a really dark caramel color. And we found that there were some variations on animals in uh, Kruger from um, the ones we saw in Kenya. They're not bigger, they're about the same size, but they uh, were darker. And here are the beautiful females. So what you typically have is a male with a, what's called a harem of females, and these are the beautiful females. One of the interesting things that we learned about Impala is that A, they are a major food source for everybody, and there's a lot of them, fortunately. But interestingly, they eat both grasses and leaves. Most of the herbivores, giraffes and the other antelope, eat either grass or tree leaves, not both. So they're very adaptable and that's and they're so they're very good survivors when, you know, let's say the grasslands are all dried up and there's only trees and leaves, they can survive just fine on that. And of course nature's brilliant because these are these, as I said, are food for a whole lot of predators. But they're just beautiful. Look at the really pretty markings on her face, almost like a little heart on her nose. And of course, their tails, when they run, go straight up and are white. And that way they can easily follow each other when they're, when they're running. So sweet. So here you have, this is another female. You can see her markings. Um, and I just love this because I just happened to catch the one bounding off. But that gives you a sense of, you know, their pretty colors. They're black on their feet. They're just gorgeous, just beautiful, graceful little things. And this, of course, <laughs> is an elephant. Um, and uh, th this is just lovely. This was again in the evening in Kruger Park. We had our, our game drive. Remember when last week when I shared that picture of the lioness that was uh, napping by the side of the road? That was on this same this same trip. <coughs> so we um, we got to see some of the elephants and these guys were sort of reddish, uh, like the Kenyan elephants. There's a little better shot, sort of, you know, brown. Not, they're not as red, actually. The, if you guys remember, maybe you don't, but my pictures from uh, Kenya, the elephants are red because the earth, if you remember from the Sheldrake, remember the babies in the mud puddles? Um, that, that, that earth is really red. And so <laughs> elephants tend to look red when in fact they are, more this color. There's a nice one. Oh, I love this one. This elephant, <laughs> this elephant decorated herself, if you can see on her head. She had picked up some leaves and thrown them over her <laughs> head. And I just love that. I thought that was hilarious. <clears throat> but you see here how brown she is. And again, that's that's due to the the earth in this area. Um, notice that one of the tusks is longer than the other. Uh, we learned that elephants are right or left tusked, like right or left handed. 
So they tend to wear down the tusk on the side that they use more. Then of course they use their tusks for digging, for scraping trees, for digging up stuff and you know lifting things. They, the males of course will, will kind of joust with each other, kind of, they, it's more like wrestling, <laughs> um, pushing each other around and kind of blocking tusks. Um, and if, just to remind everybody, both males and females grow tusks. Some elephants have one tusk and because, or since, since the poaching epidemic, many elephants are being born without tusks. Now that's really fast, quote unquote, evolution. I mean, that is a huge, a really rapid adaption. And that is happening in all, in different places in Africa. Now notice here, this, this person is very dark in color. This, again, in Kruger Park, there's different minerals and different um, uh, dirt. And so this guy is actually more naturally colored. <laughs> and you'll see too, see how green everything is? Um, every, it had rained like a week, uh, like all week before we got there. And um, our guy, Brett, said that he had just been out there and it had been dry as a bone, very little vegetation. And the beautiful thing about Africa is, as soon as it rains, within um, practically hours, the grasses start to grow, everything starts to go crazy. And so the animals had plenty to eat, uh, plenty of forage, and we're very happy about that. <coughs> Here's another great shot of somebody who's like more natural color. And that and his tusks are very even. I don't know. Oh, okay. I think that's it for my elephants. Let me come back. Um, see if this okay, we can see. Um, I may have told you this before, but I think it's worth noting. Elephants are the only um four-footed ungulate or herbivore that has their mammary glands in the front under their uh under their front legs just like breasts and human breasts and all the others have their uh, mammary glands in the back so i think that's kind of fascinating i don't have any any uh moms that you can see in my pictures today there's some very even tusks as i said now this picture i love because it shows you how the herds hang out together so what you have, and I'm going to get you guys to participate a little more. So um, who can tell me who's in this picture? What, what, what uh, animals are in this picture? Oh, zebras. Mm -hmm. And those wildebeests? Wildebeests, yep. And? And the ones that we just saw, um, impalas, yep. girls. Yep. And they will hang together. And why? Why, why would all these guys hang together? Safety in numbers? Exactly, that's exactly right. And so it's very common to see these three species hanging out together a lot. So that's why I took the picture. I wanted everybody to see um, that this is very normal. This is what you see a lot of. This I love, this is a wildebeest up close and personal. You can see um, his interesting stripes. And as I mentioned last week, the wildebeests in, in um, South Africa are quite, they're a different variation. The ones in Kenya have much more of a beard and more white on their, on their faces and they're skinnier. Um, these guys are a little heftier, you can kind of see, but aren't, isn't that striping fabulous? Um, just really interesting um, coloration. You can kind of see the guy in the back has a, almost like a goatee beard, whereas, um, and then you can see it sort of in the front here on this guy. Um, but in the in the Kenyan ones have have much more of a beard, um, and it's light colored, so they have a very different face. Here are our zebras, and these zebras have an extra stripe. You can see the lighter shadow stripe. Um, they are a different different uh, uh, variation from the zebras in Kenya, and um, you'll see. You know what? Anybody know what these birds are? These white birds? Are they cranes? Nope, they're egrets, which are like they're like cranes. They're small cranes, but they hang out and they um they they're they're there because the zebras are kicking up insects and stuff, so they're there uh you know catching catching the insects that show up. The zebra are very funny. They will scare themselves and go off running you know out of the blue. 
<laughs> they also, we learn, have a very um, inefficient digestive tract and they get very gassy. So you often see a lot of fairly bloated zebras and they fart a lot and scare themselves when they fart. <laughs> they fart, jump, ah, who did that? It's hilarious. I love this picture. I just lucked out and got this picture. So we have bookends here. <laughs> or a push me, pull you. <laughs> For those of you who remember Dr. Dulu. <laughs> but they're just beautiful. And every zebra's stripes are unique. There are no two zebras alike, which is so cool. There you can really see that shadow stripe, um, which is just really neat. So this is how you often see giraffes. Norm normally you do see them in herds, and I just adore giraffes. I've got, I've got, I have a ton of pictures of giraffes and I'll share some of my favorites with you tonight. But I wanted to show you the herd and I've got some fun questions for you. Okay, I like this picture a lot. Can anybody tell me if that's a male or a female giraffe? Because besides the, the obvious lack of boobles, <laughs> of testicles, the, one of the other ways you can identify female giraffes is that they have two horns, and on top of the horns, let's see. I, got, I have a better one of, of uh, come on. Isn't that a pretty face? Look at that. So you can clearly see the two horns. There you go. See how fuzzy they are on the top? That's another way to identify females. So they, and giraffes are born with their horns, unlike any other, um, you know, antelope, ungulate, <laughs> who get their horns, <laughs> you know, because you can imagine, but they're interestingly, they're softer when they're, when they're babies, they, you know, the, the, the horns are fairly soft and they get harder as they age. But the females have these two horns that have fur on the top and males actually have five horns. And that's really something amazing. So this is, I think this is a male, no, it's got, she's fuzzy. So that's another female eating the leaves. You can kind of see they've got these wonderful prehensile lips, these lips that can grab. And as I think I've told you before, um, these acacia trees that she's eating are very thorny. I mean, the thorns are, you know, about as long as my finger. They're really nasty. But they have, their, their lips and their very long tongues are able to get around those. But if for, if for some reason they're pricked, by a thorn, their saliva is antiseptic. And so it heals their lips or tongue very quickly if they happen to get poked. So this guy is a male um, and I don't, but you can see the top of his horns are whitish. That's because he doesn't have the fur on top of his horns. And when I say they have five horns, let me go back. Um, so here's a female again. So the male has a bigger lump of bone here and then one in the back as well. It's really pretty fascinating. So, um, and that they do use to spar with each other. They, they will, and they'll do that neck wrapping thing that they will do. That's, that's two males when they're fighting. It's not an affectionate thing. <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's a big, beautiful male. These guys are healthy. Their colors are, are, are clear and strong. <laughs> and, and the giraffes in South Africa are healthy. There are other places, uh, Ken, the Kenyan giraffes and the South African giraffes, giraffe populations are quite healthy. There are other places in Africa where they are not, where they're very endangered. Um, so some of the other countries are trying, Sudan and, you know, where there's been a lot of war, the giraffes have been decimated. So, um, so they're not, as I said, they're endangered in some places and not all places, which is good news, because of course, they will be able to, uh, for the most part, restore uh, the giraffes, because there are different subspecies from the Maasai giraffe, the Rothschild giraffe. Um, there's, a, I think, at least four uh, different different subspecies of giraffes. I just love them. There's, and they, of course, have the biggest hearts, because that heart has to pump blood all the way up to that head. So they are the biggest hearted beings on land. And here they are moving, they're just gorgeous. They're so graceful, so beautiful. Just adore them. And they're quiet, they're silent. They don't make any noise. They don't bleat, they don't, they don't 
grunt, they oh, they're silent. And um, I believe someone told us because they don't have any vocal cords. So how strange is that? What an amazing being on our planet. What an amazing, amazing being. So now we're gonna to switch to some birds. I don't have a lot of great bird pictures because birds are tricky when, with your cell phone. But these are called uh, black smith lapwings. And they're just so pretty. Here I have a, and there's a, another close up, aren't they pretty? So I just happened to luck out and have them right there on the side of the road. Now these are what? What are these guys? Vultures. They indeed are. <laughs> we uh, came upon, uh, upon a kill and we learned later because our group was in, separated into in two parts that there had been, some, there was some kind of kill in the water. And the first thing was there was a tug of war between a crocodile and a hyena, which we didn't see. So they were both trying to get whatever it was, a zebra or whatever. We, we, it wasn't clear what, what, what was in the water. But, uh, uh, but so this tug of war ensued and then another obviously higher ranking hyena came and scared off the other one. And the, so the, the crocodile ended up getting whatever he wanted and then the uh, hyena was able to get. So when they got finished, because the vultures were all hanging around and there was quite a crowd, they then went in to you know, get what they could get. And these are a lot, these are white headed vultures here. And I think we have some youngsters as well. And this is what, um, when vultures are hot or they are wet, they will open their wings to um, uh, cool off or dry off. And, I, and they do, you see them doing that a lot. So that was just fun. You can see how beautiful their wings are and those long fingers on their wings. And I just happened to catch that. I was so lucky. Is that, is that cool or what? So when they fly, of course, this is how it's easy to identify vultures. When you see them in the sky, A, they're soaring, Usually they're not flapping at all, but B, they have these long fingers on the ends of their wings. So vultures are very easy to identify if you're looking at raptors. And vultures everywhere are like that. And remember, uh, just to you know, throw this in too, vultures were sacred to the Egyptians. You guys remember why? Because they transmute death into life right? So they eat old dead stuff and they digest it and it becomes part of their living body. So they, they are uh, sacred to the transformation of death into life. And this is a beautiful shot of the Sabi River. <coughs> Again, this was, look how green and beautiful everything is. So this river, as you see, has lots of shallows and um, and it can get higher. You know, Brett said that it actually was higher, but this gives you a sense of how wide the river is and how important it is to that ecosystem. Beautiful river. And this is a different river. This is the Oliphants River. Um, but you see a very similar kind of thing of it spreading wide and, and running far. Um, so here again, we have, what I really wanted to point out here was the sky, <laughs> because here we have zebras and impalas again, um, but it, this was an incredible storm that came through, and due to this storm, a lot of interesting things happened, and, and I'll share some, some pictures that we would normally have not gotten, except for this rainstorm. So um, this rainstorm also soaked all of our gang that was in the open vehicle. I was lucky. I was in the van with Brett because I was, before we knew it was going to rain, it was supposed to be very hot, and I had to really watch uh, heat stroke because I, I got overheated in Mozambique, so I was very sensitive to the heat. And so I got to ride in the air-conditioned um, backup vehicle with Brett, which was magical because he taught me so much. He's 35 years old. He could be my kid, and he, he is so connected to the land and the animals and the stories he told us and his knowledge and his love of the land and the people. He speaks Zulu, he speaks, I don't know how many different languages. Um, he grew up, you know, this little white kid on a farm. He's Irish, Scottish, and English, fourth generation South African, and spoke Zulu before he spoke English. And so he's just, this is his homeland and he 
loves every inch of it. So he um, shared some really great stories with us, but that's, look at how dark that sky is. This is one of the great gifts the rain brought us. So the road got obviously very wet. And so these, this is a leopard spotted turtle who came out, tortoise, excuse me, who came out to drink off the road. And the good news is, is that people are very careful when they're driving because they know that some of the animals will come out to the road to drink or to warm up and dry off. <coughs> so this is a beautiful, and this, this was a small turtle. They do get, Brett said they get very big, but this one was, this one was little, kind of like our box turtle um, from the East Coast that I grew up with, Penny. Um, and this is a reticulated turtle. And I'm, see these lines on him? He's, that back flexes. How cool is that? So this is a very, fairly rare turtle that we got to see. Because um, again, he came out to drink. But I, I had never, I didn't know there were any turtles who, who could actually flex their, their shell. So cool. Now this not very good picture. <laughs> was um, of a very wet, tired lion. It was a, a bunch with a group of, of, of other boy lions, male lions. And this was a 4.30 in the morning game drive in the pouring rain. So we pulled over and everybody had to take their pictures of this poor guy who was just trying to stay warm and didn't need a lot of flashing cameras and crap. So I just got, you know, one picture of him, but he, he was clearly just trying to, you know, rest and recuperate from a long wet night but you can see that beautiful black mane that he's going to have he's young he's young now because of the rain and this was maybe my favorite part we came across these three young hyenas so these are youngsters they were and brett said i think the reason they were out on the road was that their den must have flooded so it was very wet in, in down there. So they'd come up to dry off by hanging out, dry off and run and warm up on the side of the road. Penny, did you want to ask something? Okay. Um, <laughs> I just you can you can watch you know watch them watch the guy in the back look up. This is a close up of this the one that was out at this guy over here moved uh, back with his uh, siblings. And just, doesn't that look like our dog? <laughs> just, I'm just snoozing over here. One of the coolest things that I learned, I learned about hyenas, there's the two, and this is my favorite shot. Look at that face. Hyenas are neither cat nor dog. They are their, of the, in their own phylum. They have characteristics of felines and characteristics of canines, but they are unique. There's no other animal like them. The other thing I learned is that they are a completely matriarchal society. And uh, the, all the females have a higher status than the males. And they are some of the most, if not the most efficient hunter in Africa. I thought that mostly they ate carrion and stole prey from, you know, other, like the big cats, the lions and the cheetahs. But in fact, only 40% of their diet is uh, carrion and, and, and other kills. 60% of their um, diet is their own hunting. And they hunt in a pack and they're extremely strong and efficient. They can run, they, they can trot, their, their endurance is amazing. They, they've gotten a bad rap, you know, in The Lion King, they made them to be so bad, and they're not. They're, they're amazing animals, extremely intelligent, and I just fell in love with them. So this was this first group. Oh, and the one in the wrong way, sorry. <laughs> a little wet and trying to warm up. Sweetest face, oh my gosh. And then we drove further just a little bit more down the road, and we came on two more little cubs. These guys were quite a bit younger. They were little, little. <laughs> and again, Brett said, yeah, I think they're just warming up after. And, and we said, do you think they're related to the others? And he said, probably not, because they're from a much younger litter. Um, so I was able to get a couple of sweet, sweet pictures of them. 
just adorable. And what I loved about this, you guys, is look how calm they all are. You know, no, but none of them were phased, and we were the only vehicle there. And so we got this precious time with these amazing, amazing beings. It was such a gift, such a gift. Look at that face. <laughs> okay, so does anybody know what these are? I know they're tracks. Whose? <laughs> Want to venture a guess? No, nope, Penny, you can't. Somebody else. <laughs> what do you think? Now, what do they have? In, now, look at them. Are they canine or feline? Feline. Why, Pen? <clears throat> I think they're lion tracks, but I'm not sure. Why did you say feline? Uh, I guess they just look like cat paws. Well, they look like cat paws because cats, were, you know, withdraw their uh, claws, except for cheetahs. But the, all the other cats withdraw their claws. So when you see a print like this, you don't see any claws, right? If it was a canine, you would see the claws or a bear, right? Right, so you see yeah. the nail prints, yeah. Yeah, no nails, right, no claws. Yes, these are lions. These are lions. Do I get a prize? <laughs> <laughs> I maybe. I'm not kidding. <laughs> you got what you want for a prize. So there's I'm a close up, and you can see. You can also see that uh, you know there's no claw, no claw prints there. And <laughs> as we were driving, uh, um, actually, we, this was before we saw the hyenas. We came across this pride, and this was just magical. This is sort of like sand that had washed down on the road. And again, they were just enjoying that it was warmer, it wasn't raining. And so there were one, two, three, four, five, uh, two young males and three females. And uh, there were a lot, there were quite a few vehicles on, our, you know, on the side where we are, but everybody was very polite. There was no pushing and shoving of vehicles. Um, <laughs> there were probably <coughs> four or five vehicles. And in Kruger, you can, you, you can take a self-guided tour. You can go in your car. You don't have to be in an official vehicle like you do in Kenya. So there were people like, you know, with their cars and their vans and, you know, just having a nice day in the park. Um, so here you see that one beautiful female in the back there and the two young males. Um, Brett said that he thought the, the males were probably, the one in the back was maybe three and the one in the front maybe two. So they're likely brothers. There, another picture of them looking a little more. And, the, and meanwhile, the lioness is like, okay, I'm done, I'm gonna snooze. There she is looking up. Yeah, the boys, handsome boys. These guys look very well fed. They look very healthy and fine. And there's my lioness shot. Oh. She was just gorgeous, just gorgeous. So now she is on my Facebook page, um, my main photo there, just the most beautiful thing. And I wanna draw your attention to two things, the spots on the ears and the white around her eyes. Okay, so what are the whites around her eyes there for? Who wants to, who wants to guess? Is it for like ref helping with reflection from the sun or anything like that? Reflects the, the, the moonlight. It's okay. To, it's to help with night vision. Yes, it creates more light coming into the eye so that they can see better at night. And all the big cats have that. Leopards, tigers, cheetah, <coughs> they all have that white around their eyes that makes their eyes stand out and look so beautiful, but it has a very practical purpose. And the spots on the ears are part of camouflage. So when they're going through the tall grass, they're harder to see. I mean, they're hard to see anyway. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, but just magnificent. Oh, just love her. Well, that's interesting. What was that? Ah, okay. Hold on. Okay, I inadvertently, uh, now I wanna get rid of all this stuff again. 
Come on. There we go. Let's try this. All right. Sorry, guys. This should bring it back. Maybe my computer's slow. Okay. Darn. Okay, great. Shoot. Okay. Oh. That's really weird. Hold on, guys. Oh, I know, because that's my last slide. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that I was going to stop with her. And um, and uh, as I said, I have more slides of South Africa of the um, the incredible scenery that we saw. Some very famous places, the Blyde River Canyon, and um, it's the beautiful, beautiful um, B and B where we stayed. Uh, it was a vegan. B and B, &B. and the, the the lady of the house, Marianne, and her husband Paul had uh, it had been in the family this house since the 1930s. So I'll share more about that and her amazing cooking and just the atmosphere, the energy there was magical. So that's where I wanted to stop tonight because I didn't want to overwhelm you guys with too many pictures. Um, <coughs> now that's one thing is weird though. I wish, okay, okay, I thought that I had some pictures of the water bucks, so I will, um, I will make sure that we have the water bucks in our next, um, our next uh, session, because there's some really cool things about those antelope, um, just like the impala, you know, have their interesting ability to eat different things, um, the water bucks uh, have some very, very unusual characteristics that no other antelope has, and they're stunning and beautiful. And I also have pictures of kudu. Um, Tamar got a great picture of a kudu. I have kind of a kudu moving, and, the, and I've got some really great pictures of the female kudus, which are the largest antelope in South Africa. They're stunning, just amazingly beautiful. So any questions about tonight, <coughs> the pictures tonight, or anything we talked about? Or anything else? That was so beautiful. I love the um, hyenas. Aren't they wonderful? Yep, just amazing, amazing creatures. And there was a biologist who um, who studied lions and 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 lots of different uh, predators. And somebody asked him if you had a choice, what predator would you be? And he said, Well, you know, I'd like to say lion, but honestly the most adaptable, the most effective, successful hunters are the hyenas. They will, they will survive when the others won't. Yeah, but they laugh a lot. <laughs> they laugh, that's it. It's cause they laugh. Life is good. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, they take themselves lightly. <laughs> huh. so they make a lot of amazing vocalizations actually. In Kenya, we did hear them. Um, making a lot of interesting sounds. Um, didn't even know what it was until, you know, people at the lodge would say, or the camp would say, oh yeah, those were hyenas last night. So they, like wolves and coyotes, they will vocalize for all kinds of different reasons, communication and, and uh, but also celebration during a hunt, you know, when they've caught something, um, you know, you, you know, the, the coyotes howl and carry on and sing and celebrate and, and these the hyenas do too. Telling so jokes and stuff. Tell jokes, yeah. Tell jokes, <laughs> stories, sing the songs. <laughs> Have a grand old time. So, yeah, I'm gonna. I I, I want to learn more from hyena about hyenas and from them as well as just yeah, learn from learn about them because they're just. Extreme. So maybe we need to do a talk with them. I think we do. I mm -hmm. think we absolutely <laughs> need to have a hyena chat. <laughs> because I love, again, I love the fact that they're totally matriarchal. It's not an alpha pair like it is with wolves. Um, 
And uh, interestingly, and we didn't see any, but happily, the wild dog population is coming back in South Africa. They've done a lot of work because the wild dogs are absolutely stunning, beautiful beings, and they're definitely canines. They are also matriarchal, um, and they were almost wiped out by parvo because oh. they got it from domestic dogs, and they were really in trouble. But South Africa has made a very strong concerted effort to protect them, bring them back, and also rant or shoot them, you know, the usual crap when it comes to canines, you know, they're vermin and blah, 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 you know, whether they're coyotes, wolves, or in this case, the wild dogs, but they're beautiful and so special. And again, tons of vocalizations and conversations. I would have loved to have seen one. We did see some jackals. Um, those are always tricky to get on camera because they're usually on the move. They're beautiful. They look slightly like coyotes, but they're different. Um, but they're about the size of a coyote, and um, and they're they are they are very successful hunters as well. But they are more they don't hunt in packs. <coughs> they're more like foxes in that they are they have they they have they are solitary and, and then also come together to um, to breed and raise raise the pups. Um, um, but the wild dogs and the hyenas will raise their and we refer to hyenas as cubs, not pups. Um, the wild dogs will all raise their pups together like wolves do. And, um, and so I want also to learn more from, about the wild dogs because they're very special. Um, different from dingoes, you know, um, because dingoes, of course, were dogs that were brought to Australia from the islands. But the African wild dog was there just like the hyenas and the lions and everybody else. So, like I said, I'm very, I'd seen a documentary a while ago on the wild dogs, and it was pretty bleak, and it was very worrisome because of the parvo. But like I say, this trip reassured me that the wild dogs were, were um, coming back, and they're doing a lot to protect them and raise awareness about how they contribute to the ecosystem. They don't just make things difficult for ranchers. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I think they were hunted more by white ranchers than they were by native peoples. Um, an interesting thing to share about the tribes in South Africa that we learned, our driver Rufus was from a small tribe, I can't remember what it's called, um, he is with a P, but he was sharing with us how, and Brett, of course, being raised along with the Zulus, they basically told us that the the tribes the african tribes are very patriarchal women are really treated as second class citizens he said in his tribe women are not allowed to eat eggs or children are not allowed to eat eggs or chicken except the beaks and the feet and you know this whole idea of the warrior culture right so that the men get the best of everything and the women and children get what's left over i mean kind of like a lion pride, unfortunately, you know, the, the lionesses do all the work and then the big male lion comes in and takes out everything he wants. And then they, they get what they want and often the cubs, you know, and then they, there's a hierarchy to that. But, um, you know, and there's still, a lot of them are still polygamous. So the chief, the head, the king, well, there's one that they were talking about who's the king of part of this big area of South Africa and he picks a new wife every year. All these women are paraded in front of him, picks a new one, and gives her a BMW or a Mercedes. Really? So, unfortunately, the feminine is not terribly valued in most of these cultures, which is disappointing. Um, and so, uh, it's interesting when you find how vilified the hyena's been and their matriarchal culture. Isn't that interesting? Thank you. So, um, <coughs> and of course, a lot of corruption in Africa, as you know, and, and a lot of that is this, this, this patriarchy and this sense of entitlement of now that I'm king, I can have everything and, you know, I don't have to give anything to anybody except my wives. Um, so South Africa politically is in a tough spot because of the corruption. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's, 
there's still a lot of animosity, unfortunately, between um, a lot of the blacks and whites. Um, of course, there've been there was a lot of progress made with Desmond Tutu and um, Nelson Mandela, and the reconciliation, which was huge. But um, there's still, you know, those issues haven't completely gone away. And the Afrikaners are very conservative. They are their background is German and Dutch. And they are very religiously conservative and politically conservative and very, um, according to Brett, um, very isolationist for the most part. And so the white South Africans are mostly English, but you know, he, there's the Afrikaners, there's the white South, the, the English uh, South Africans, and then there are all the, the, the different tribes. Um, so it isn't easy to bring all those people together. Uh, so, um, but man, is it a beautiful land with so much heart. Like Kenya, I found myself not really relating to Mozambique. Don't know why. It just didn't touch me like Kenya did. And then when I got to South Africa, I felt the same thing. Wow, there is something unbelievably special and beautiful about this land. And perhaps it's because there is just such an incredible number of wild beings. I mean, just phenomenal. You know, and you see them all over the place. <coughs> there is still some poaching and there's still some trophy hunting in South Africa, which, you know, lots of different organizations are working on. So, um, and I wanted to end with a with, um, very interesting conversation I had on Facebook. I don't know how many of you saw this, but I posted um, something about Trump's, um, or he, he created this they were supposed to be conservationists and they were all trophy hunters. You know, this was for, uh, funded by taxpayers. Of course, you know, Donald Trump Jr. was part of this. And a lot of the environmental organizations have been suing to stop this or this, you know, organization or whatever it's called. Um, and then they finally, they finally said they were going to sue the individuals. And that's when it got shut down. So I posted something online saying, good news, this you know, this, this group of trophy hunters that are trying to continue to bring in endangered animals' bodies into our country are, is no more. And I got an interesting, I got into an interesting conversation with a woman who, get this, is a vegan and pro-trophy hunting. <gasps> Go figure. I mean, I found that out sort of at the end of the conversation, but it was... <laughs> It was fascinating in that, you know, she kind of towed the party line about how trophy hunting supports conservation efforts and, you know, and they're not, and then when she said, they're not hunting endangered animals, I'm, I said, excuse me? Yes, they are. I know, excuse me? What are you talking about? I said, every animal I listed, rhino, uh, all the, the, the big five, leopard, lion, rhino, they're all a giraffe. I said, except for the giraffe in some places, they are all highly endangered. What are you talking about? Was it the lady from your first trip? <gasps> no, this wasn't anybody I knew. This was somebody. I know, I'm kidding. I was no. talking about that last oh, trip. Thank that. you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, would have, I don't know what I would have done. But no. So this was somebody who had friended me on Facebook. And apparently she had worked in South America. And um, she, was, she was all ready to shoot poachers but thought that somehow trophy hunting was a good thing. And when she finally told me she was a vegan, I was like, I want, I should, I, I, you know, we were at the end of our conversation because the last thing she said to me was, oh, because I had said that the only animal that kills for fun is it, it, it are humans. And she came back with, that's not true, felines and, you know, orcas and blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I've talked to the animals. And I said, when that happens, it's because something is out of balance. It's mm -hmm. not a normal thing for them to torment another being mm -hmm. and throw it around. It's just not. Something is out of whack. That those animals are stressed. And she, she then she she didn't didn't know how to address that. And finally she said, Oh, I know who you are. You're that lady from Lions who talks to animals. She says, Oh, okay. I'm gonna stick with my behaviors training. Have a good day. And so oh. I just said, Okay, we're done. But what what it was at the end of that, you know, it was like in the second to last thing she said, and, and I'm a vegan. And I really, you know, I was so shocked by that, <laughs> that I didn't have a chance to go, excuse me, 
you're the first vegan I've ever met who was pro trophy hunting. I don't get these two things. I'm sorry. <laughs> How does that work? So, well, so she's a vegan for health reasons, <coughs> not for any spiritual or moral reasons. That's what I would assume. But she was vegan for what reason? I, I would say that her, just on what you told me, the basis of her veganism probably has to do more with the preservation of her own health than it has to do with the preservation and treatment of animals. May, perhaps. You know, again, we sort of ended the conversation because we were not really getting anywhere. Because and she's your Facebook friend? Well, she was a Facebook friend. I didn't unfriend her, but she's not going to communicate with me anymore because a couple people came in and said, uh, excuse me, do you know who the, you know, do you know you're in a group of people who love animals and who are not going to support trophy hunting no matter what? <laughs> right. <laughs> and somebody oh else, you know, God. said, hey, you have the, you have the patience of, of Job to be even having this conversation. But it was, it, it was fascinating in that anything I said that contradicted her, she would just come up with another point, right? She would just come up with another justification for her perspective. Yeah. Well, she's obviously stupid. <laughs> I mean, in terms, in terms of she doesn't actually have data. I mean, when you make a statement about, you know, hey, trophy hunting really helps cull the herd for conservation purposes, you don't have any facts. No. It's don't. a myth. Right. And the idea, you know, and I, of course, I mentioned that the trophy hunters are taking the best and most beautiful, the healthiest, biggest. Yeah. Uh, and that is not how any other, spe you know, any of the predators do it. She didn't address that. But she had some very strange information about, you know, that they, they own, that, you know, that they don't hunt any endangered species. I'm like, uh, so she has no data. She has no data. Well, she thought she did. You know, she was sure that she had all the data to back this up and that I didn't know what I was talking about. So right. it was fascinating. But like I say, how interesting to meet a vegan who is pro-trophy hunting. So He's an animal yeah. murderer. Yeah. Yeah, it's just very, very odd. So, but it was a good opportunity for me to share, <coughs> you know, my perspective, but also what I know in terms of, you know, conservation uh, is, is, is not that's not the way to go, right? The trophy hunting obviously puts a lot of money into just a few people's pockets and not back to the villages and not back to the land. And that's a big myth, um, which they continue to uh, support. Um, and so uh, these beings, like I say, the good news is, is that conservation is alive and well in South Africa. And um, they do try to engage the local people as much as possible, like they do in Kenya. Conservation in Kenya is, is really top notch. Um, and the Shelter Trust has a lot to do with that because they raise a lot of money very successfully through their foster program. And then they, but they use it not only for the baby elephants and other babies that they rescue, but they have education, they have, they, they have vet units all around Kenya who go out and, you know, uh, take care of animals that have been injured either by humans or in, you know, in the case of the lion that we came across, he got into a fight with another lion. So they are doing a tremendous amount of engaging the local people and um, with education and, and activities and um, arts and crafts that earn money for the villagers, um, lots of good stuff. So that's really hopeful. And I want really to end on a note of there are some excellent, excellent organizations in Kenya, Uganda, and, and uh, Judy's had wonderful experience with the, there's a um, cheetah. Is that in Namibia, Judy, the Cheetah Trust? Are you still there? Anyway, she, I Judy. Unmute herself. Yeah, she yeah I'm here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the Cheetah Conservation Fund, Dr. Lori Marker. They're doing remarkable things in Namibia. Namibia, right. But right. they're also, she has an effect in Somalia, India, and also I, Iraq or Iran. Wow. She, yeah. Oh, yeah, she's big. She <laughs> not only, not only is it for the cheetahs, but also they, um, they take these thorny bushes and they make them into logs and it's for the uh, heat. So they they generate energy that way, and then they also have a goat goat farm, and they have a dairy. Um, well, it's a cheese factory. Oh wow! So she's a fan. and then they provide uh, Anatolian dogs 
for the farmers so that the farmers don't shoot the cheetahs um, and the Anatolian dogs will fight, fight off, scare off the cheetahs. So it's a whole encompassing thing for the whole country of Namibia, the whole cultural thing. It's, it's, okay. pheno it's a phenomenal organization. Well, and really. I, that's beautiful. And I will say, you know, it's fascinating to me because that's a woman and what is she doing creating all these collaborations all this oh, yeah. mission. Same with the Sheldrick, you know, Dame Daphne and now her daughter, Angela, same thing. Um, Angela, who has the uh, dolphin, the eco tours um, in uh, um, uh, Mozambique, you know, that's her whole thing is, is we've got to work with the local people and, and create that love and interest. Um, so this is, is so interesting how women work this way. And yeah, it's yeah for Laura and for Laura, you know, she's really not into like oh let's you know because I'm a woman or anything. She's not into that. No, it's just, she's just being very effective in what she does because she has a passion and she's been doing it for year. I mean years and years right. and years, and, and her life has been dedicated to it. It's an ah. Uh, are any of you Penny Gloria in the Denver metro area? No, what area? No. No, the Denver no. metro area, because she comes back usually twice a year, and she'll be back in the fall. Oh, Judy, keep and she does a tour, and she's a fascinating woman, a very fascinating woman, just well, uh, incredible. What I would love is if you would send me her website, and I'll share it with everybody, because she may do tours outside of Denver, too, right? She may do tours. Oh, yeah, she Denver. goes, oh, yeah, all around. She goes, where, where are you, Gloria and Penny? I'm in New Jersey, Penny. Wow. And I'm in Taos, New Mexico. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> really fun. too bad, Gloria. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. In Australia, so. Yeah, Siobhan's in Australia, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, she doesn't go to Australia, but yeah. She does um, in out in the East New Jersey. Oh, I don't think so. The New York area though, probably. Yeah, no, New no. York, probably, but yeah. I'm not sure. But she does a lot in California, DC, probably DC, California. Okay. Well, I would just suspect New York because of the money. You know, there's so much money in the metro area. So normally, yeah, so, um, yeah. but she does a lot in, in the California and she's, she, um, her contacts and what she's doing is absolutely incredible. Awesome. It is incredible. Thank you for sharing. So yeah, send me her website and I'll share with everybody. Gloria, do you know all the rich people down there? We could have her go down there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been to, a, Santa Fe. Uh, been to a couple of parties where there are celebrities through, you know, just through somebody I know, but I, I really haven't gotten to know them very well. Santa Fe would, Santa Fe could be a good place, but she comes to Denver and, um, and actually the Denver metro area is not that developed for it. <laughs> I mean, we are, but not that much. And I don't have time to really, I'm on the committees, but we, I don't, can't contribute that much time because I'm too busy, but, but it's really a phenomenal organization, really. Well, thank you. Yeah, like I say, send me the link and we'll share it. And cheetahs, my heart just jumps when I see cheetahs. I, I'll have they're to you. I know. I, there's something about them. I, I have. I bought a shirt that has this incredible, absolutely photographic face of a cheetah on it that I couldn't resist. We didn't see any cheetah on this trip. We had seen the guys in Kenya, the five musketeers, the uh, cheetahs that are working together uh, like a like a uh, pack. Um, and that's fair, fairly unusual. They, they don't normally do that. But so we didn't see cheetahs on this trip, but then I got my fill of hyena energy, which was just lovely. So I want to respect everybody's time. Thank you so much for watching tonight and being with us. And as I say, I'll have some more slides. I have the kudu to share and the water buck to share. And then these places that we saw in our last day <laughs> driving uh, from Kruger National Park back to Johannesburg. We actually went up and then down. And Anyway, so we'll have more next week. And um, Siobhan, I know you mentioned you want to have a picture of that lioness's face. <laughs> I'd be happy to send her. If, um, if you'd like any others, let me know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, Thank you. Uh, 
I said, thank you, that'd be great. You bet, so let me know who else you want, because these are all my photos, so I can do whatever I want with them. <laughs> so again, thank you all, and- um, Okay, that, that cheetah.org takes you to that website. Cheetah.org, okay, that's easy, super, mm -hmm. thank you. That's really easy, good for her, get that. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks again. Have a lovely night. Night. We will night. see you next week. Yay. Be good. <laughs> Bye.